When the Yankee Band Played Dixie by Archibald Rutledge. As a young man just out of college, I went to teach in a preparatory school for boys in the picturesque village of Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, situated in the lower Cumberland Valley. The year was 1904, and at that time there were still living in Mercersburg many veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic. This rural outpost had been one of the main routes between Harrisburg and Washington, D.C., and was an important station on the Underground Railroad, which had helped so many slaves escape into the North during the Civil War. The war between the states was still fresh in the minds of these people, I thought. Their homes had been subjected to raids by Southern troops, and only a little to the northward, the important city of Chambersburg had been burned by the Confederate General McLaughlin. I was the son of a Confederate colonel, and I was scared knowing that this was enemy territory and that the wounds of that cruel war were still raw and bleeding. It was not that the people were not kind to me, but I felt alien and was certain that I was resented. Also, I had the perhaps unworthy feeling that some of these same old G.A.R. men had helped to devastate my homeland. Despite the fact that I was a stranger and they took me in, I was not happy and had a feeling of apprehension. Yet, in the school year past, without any untoward incidences, except the somewhat bewildering graciousness of the old Union soldiers towards me. We used to talk for hours. That winter, one of them died and left me his entire library. I seemed to make many friends, but I called no one Yank, although everyone called me Johnny Reb. It occurred to me that it might be an affectionate appellation, but I was none too sure. Throughout that first year, one of my closest friends was Dr. James G. Rose, the Presbyterian minister. He was a cousin of President William McKinley's. We used to play chess together, and I learned that I could lay some of my personal problems on his lap. At length, the springtime came, and on the eve of Memorial Day, still rather solitary and uncertain of my position in this community, I walked up to the ancient and beautiful cemetery that overlooks the town from a wooded hill. I had been there before to admire the primeval oaks and cedars under which Indians must have camped before white settlers came to that region in 1750. As I wandered through this hushed and sacred God's acre, I saw that loving and remembering hands had already laid flowers and had set upright little American flags on all the graves of federal soldiers. A little apart from these, I came upon three Confederate graves. I was touched to see that they too had been decorated with flowers and had little American flags on them. I thought of the beautiful lines that Francis Miles Finch, a northerner, wrote when he saw that the federal graves had been remembered in the South by the daughters of the Confederacy. No more shall the war cry or serve, or the winding rivers be red. They banished our anger forever when the laurel the graves of our dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, love and tears for the blue, tears and love for the gray. The cemetery in which I stood commanded a superb view of the great Cumberland Valley and of the mountains which rose on either side of it. On the eve of this hallowed memorial day, all was at peace. Yet here, great armies had marched, and here, brother had slain brother. Nature had long since done her part to heal the wounds of the war, and I was to learn that human nature, though working more slowly, could come at last to a beautiful reconciliation, for here before me compassionate hands that had impartially covered with flowers the graves of friend and foe. Kneeling in the twilight at the three Confederate headstones, I read the names J.W. Alban, W.H. Quaintance, and Unknown. I recognized Alban and Quaintance as Virginia names. I wondered if the families and friends of these three soldiers of the South knew what became of them. That night I visited my good friend, Dr. Rose. Why, yes, he said when I told him how touched I had been to see all the soldiers' graves decorated. We are never partial when it comes to the men who fought. I guess each side was fighting, was fighting for a part of our country. The graves marked unknown is that of a raider who was killed right here in our town square. Alban and Quaintance were, I believe, Virginians. They were both mortally wounded at Gettysburg. On Lee's retreat from that battlefield, a good many of his wounded men were nursed right here in the school buildings by some of our good townspeople. Why, he added, 
Miss Alice Fenwick, I've heard, helped to nurse those two men. You must be sure to talk to her in the face of death, he added. People are likely to forget hatred. As I had met Miss Alice at one of my school's social functions, it was not difficult for me to call on her. Then, in her late sixties, and looking like a dressed in China doll, she received me graciously. Why, yes, she said, in answer to my question about the two soldiers she had helped to nurse. I remember the boys vividly, John Alban and Will Quaintance. Each one was terribly wounded, and neither one could live. You know, in those days, we were so little medicine of any kind, and nearly all our doctors were with the armies. I did all I could, but it was not enough. John was stoical, but Will did not want to die. Towards the end, he was delirious and kept calling in the most pleading voice for Haley. I never discovered who she was. And you did this just out of the goodness of your heart, I asked. Why not? There were wounds and lonely and suffering. And she went on, we saw to it that they were given beautiful Christian burials. I told her how deeply affected I had been when I saw the three lonely graves in that Pennsylvania cemetery had not been neglected. It's the least we can do, she said. I believe your daughters of the Confederacy and the Deep South honor our boys who lie buried far from home. When a war is over, she added, it should be over in hearts as well as on the battlefields. At that time, the Richmond, Virginia Times Dispatch carried what it called the Confederate Column. It ran news about the old soldiers. For this paper, I wrote a little article about what I had discovered in southern Pennsylvania. A few days after it appeared, a letter came to me from Bristol, Virginia. It was signed Haley, Mrs. W. H. Quaintance. In part, the letter read, When I was a young bride, my husband disappeared on the Gettysburg campaign. From your article, I am sure you have found his grave. I would like so much to come see where he is lying. I was not at all certain about the propriety of having another southerner come to Mercersburg, so I decided to consult my good friend, Dr. Rose. He read with grave interest my letter from Mrs. Quaintance. It's quite wonderful, he said. Of course she must come and don't worry, we'll take good care of her. Haley Quaintance was to come by a train that reached Mercersburg later in the afternoon. I was to meet her, and I was told that she was to be entertained by Mrs. Alice Fenwick. The great afternoon found me reassured to some degree, yet still apprehensive. Since the tiny station was usually a rather desolate and deserted place, I was filled with amazement when I approached it that day. The whole town was there. There was the GAR band. There were all old GAR veterans in all uniforms. There was a special carriage for the arriving guests of honor. There were scores of little flower girls with bouquets. People filled the streets by the station and overflowed across the tracks. I could feel the air of loving welcome. The train rounded a curve, chugging towards the station. At once, the G.A.R. band began to play Dixie, and all the old Federal soldiers, their caps covering their hearts, stood at attention. I remember meeting Mrs. Quaintance and conducting her carriage through the cheering and applauding throng. Then, led by the band, we all marched up to the cemetery. At every step in these proceedings, I could see how carefully Dr. Rose had planned this welcome, as heartfelt as if this community had been a kingdom, and Mrs. Quaintance, its reigning queen, returned from a far journey. In both in appearance and in manner, she was worthy of this gracious reception. As we drew near the three Confederate graves in reverent silence, all the most impressive because, unrehearsed, the crowd formed a great circle. Across this to the grave of one she walked, loved, walked Haley Quaintance. On that sacred mound, she laid a wreath of flowers and knelt there briefly. When she rejoined us, her face had upon it a light of loving gratitude and spiritual peace. For me, this reception of a Confederate soldier's widow by Union veterans and their friends and families meant, in truth, the end of the Civil War. It meant cease firing and the burial of the guns. It meant I could feel at home in what I thought was an alien land. Indeed, I no longer wanted to be a mere Southerner. I had learned how much greater it is to be an American. That was when the Yankee band played Dixie by Archibald Rutledge.